Hey folks, just wanted to put together a quick video going over last week's uh, material. I've finished the grading, and I just want to point out a few things about the essays, discussion boards, that sort of a thing, and then give you a preview for this week, what we're going to go into. So uh, the first thing that I wanted to kind of explain is sort of the purpose for each of the assignments. The graded, or sorry, the, gui the guided reading, the primary purpose of this assignment is to direct you to some of the most important material in the reading. That doesn't mean that that's the only reading you need to do is what's relevant to the guided reading. The point there is after you've read through the assigned reading for the week, you'll go into the guided reading, and it will help you dig in a little bit to the more important parts. And so oftentimes, there will be questions in there that are relevant to the discussion board or toward the essay. Not always, but that, that often happens. So think of the guided reading as an opportunity to focus in on some of the material. We know that there is a ton of reading that you have to do. You read over 100 pages just in the textbook, uh, let alone Isaiah, which is one of the largest books in the uh, Bible. So you did a ton of reading last week, and maybe some of you are behind on that reading. Uh, let me take a quick opportunity to remind you that the Bible reading, I am okay with you getting through that Bible reading through an audio Bible or something like that. Um, I'm okay with you listening to it at double speed. The important thing there is to make sure that you're actually listening when you do that, though. I don't want you listening to the Bible reading while you're sleeping or, or while you're working on something and you're not focused on it. You need to be listening to what you're hearing, okay? But you can listen to it at a higher speed to help you get through it quicker if you want to. The idea is not for you to dig into the details of the text in this reading. The the textbook reading will help kind of bring out some of the important details. The idea for the biblical reading is for you to get a good overview of a significant amount of material. Oftentimes when we do either our devotional reading of scripture or even when we do Bible reading at church, that sort of a thing, we're focused in on a pretty small segment of text. Uh, rarely do we read an entire chapter, let alone an entire book. And so what the reading in this course is designed to do is to give you a very broad perspective of Isaiah. Reading through the whole, ideally, you'll go through all of Isaiah in one sitting. Now. Isaiah is a very large book to do that with. But as much as possible, try to do the reading each book at once. That's sort of the goal here is for you to get a big picture of what's going on in the text. Uh, so in addition to reading 66 chapters of Isaiah, which some of you may be behind on, some of you may be behind on your reading of the textbook, uh, you still have time to make that up. Your reading report isn't due until the end of the semester. So um, don't get too far behind, but if you are behind, um, you, you have opportunities throughout the semester to catch back up. Uh, if you have an audio version of the textbook for whatever reason, and you want to listen to it that way so that you know maybe you can get through some of the reading while you're driving or whatever, uh, that's okay as well. But again, the, the reading report at the end of the semester is going to uh, ask you how much of the reading you completed with a reasonable amount of care. And what we're really saying there is how much of the reading did you pay attention to? Uh, if you're just skimming through the entire book, you're not paying attention to what you're reading. You might be reading headings in the first sentence of a paragraph or something like that, but that's not 100% reading. So I'm not saying you can't go through this reading quickly. I'm just saying you need to pay attention to what you're reading. Um, that said, uh, there are ways to, to try to get through the reading uh, in a, a, an efficient manner. If you have questions about that, just ask. Um, I'll be reasonable with you, but uh, I, I don't want you to get bogged down in the assignments just because the reading takes so much time. Uh, so let's try to find a way to uh, be as efficient as possible with that. So again, the purpose of the guided reading is to focus you in on some of the more, ma more important material from the textbook reading. The, important of the, dis the uh, purpose, rather, of the discussion boards is to give you an opportunity to um, formulate your ideas and then get pushback on them. So that's one reason why you're required to make three additional posts, substantial, and I'll talk about what substantial means, three additional posts in addition to your initial post. We want you to make a, a post, and again, the difference between what you're doing in the discussion board versus the essay, the discussion board is going to be a lot less formal. Um, there, aren't, <laughs> there isn't as much of a need for uh, formatting, or, or and the, the tone is a lot more casual in the discussion board. Uh, obviously, since there's interaction there, you want to make sure that when you're responding to others, you're doing so in a kind way. It uh, doesn't mean you can't criticize an argument. You just want to criticize it kindly. You want to give your um, the person you're interacting with, you want to give them the benefit of the doubt. You want to make suggestions rather than uh, having a harsh tone or a, an overly critical tone. Um, speak to so correct someone the way you would want to be corrected is the general idea. Uh, so interact kindly but critically. Uh, when it comes to the interaction portion there, just a couple things I want to point out to you, so we'll go to the Unit 1 discussion board. Uh, this peer interaction, this is outlining what's expected of you in the interaction section. Uh, so keep in mind there is a rubric available. Um, I have copied the rubric into this first announcement. Uh, you see that there are five different areas of the discussion board that you're going to be graded on. This one is primarily your you know, your basic spelling stuff, grammar. Resources, in order to get full credit here, you need to actually provide citations to the secondary reading, your textbook reading. Um, and importantly, not just including like a quotation, but if you include a quotation, explain why you're including the quotation. You need to evaluate the statements of the author, not just uncritically incorporate them. You need to show that you've thought about them. Um, you know, Chisholm says this, and I agree with him because dot, dot, dot. Or Chisholm says this, I disagree for this reason. Explain why you agree or disagree with the author when you incorporate the textbook reading in your discussion board. Same to be said for incorporating the discussion or incorporating the textbook reading into your essay. 
You should indicate why you're incorporating it, why you agree or disagree. And then scripture, you want to cite details from the text, not just, you know, the first half of Isaiah is about this. Show me where you see that theme throughout the first section. Um, interaction. This is going to be uh, linked directly back to this peer interaction idea here. So three substantial responses in addition to your initial post, and these are the different types of posts that would be considered substantial. One where you either analyze another student's posts, addressing its strengths, weaknesses, or shortcomings, and building off. You don't just say what you like and what you don't like. You actually build off of it and push the conversation forward. Give suggestions, things like that. If you ask questions of one of your peers, you need to provide sort of a provisional or tentative answer of your own. Like, here's how I would answer the question I'm asking you. What do you think of this answer? Otherwise, if you just ask people a bunch of questions, you're just making them do more research. So you need to show that you've thought about the question as well. Uh, you can also post a new, a revised version of your initial post uh, that kind of incorporates the feedback that you've gotten. This should be a separate post. Don't just edit your initial post. Another idea is you can post new comments to other people um, and when you do that, again, provide your own sort of tentative response there. But just commenting on another person's post is sufficient as long as you are moving the conversation forward, okay? Don't just say what you like or what you don't like. Uh, and then another option is to create a brand new post where you're sort of summarizing the discussion as a whole. What's been said in this discussion board? What are the different views that have been represented? Uh, this won't be appropriate for every discussion board. So, you know, unit one's discussion, everybody picked a different passage. So this prob probably wouldn't be a, a great way to uh, do a, a substantial post, you know, the summary post, unless you wanted to summarize like, hey, everybody seemed to pick a passage that had to do with this or something like that. So um, honestly, one of your three substantial responses could just be a brand new post commenting on the discussion as a whole. But you need to do three of those substantial posts in order to get full credit for peer interaction. If you're asking another student a question, um, other than a simple clarification like, did you mean this or did you mean that? Or can you tell me more about what you said here? If you're asking a question about new information, then you need to provide some sort of tentative response to show that you've also thought about this question and give them an answer that they can consider. All right. So, and, and then one more thing I'll say about interaction. Um, please make sure that, I understand that if someone comments on your initial post on Sunday night, I don't expect everybody to be checking their initial posts at 11.50 p.m. to make sure that they've responded to everybody. But check your initial posts on Sunday because anybody who has posted before Sunday, replied before Sunday to your initial post, you should acknowledge their post. You know, they have taken the time to comment on what you've said. Um, I want to see that you've read that by all you have to do is you know, something as simple as, hey, thanks for posting, good point, something like that. Just something to indicate to that person that you've read what they've said. Okay, so again, if, if those posts pop up on Sunday, don't worry about them. But on Sunday, check your initial post to see who all has responded. And any response or any reply to your initial post that occurs before Sunday, I, I want you to respond to, again, you don't have to dig in deep. It doesn't have to be one of your substantial posts, but just an acknowledgement that you've read it. Um, and then obviously, if I ask you any questions, it says here, you're required to respond to the instructor and peer questions or comments on your post. So that, that's where this is coming from. And then the final category there was reflection. Uh, and what reflection basically means is, are you thinking critically? Are you just listing information, listing facts, or are you actually uh, synthesizing information, uh, analyzing what you're reading, and evaluating it? Drawing application, that sort of a thing. Uh, so th that's, that's really the focus of the discussion board is, we wanna try to get you to start formulating your thoughts based on your reading, and then get pushback from other students. Uh, have them show you things you may not have thought about. All of that is going to prepare you for the reflection essay, that interaction, even if the reflection essay is on a slightly different topic than the discussion post, that pushback is important in helping you um, think critically about your own understanding of the material. Okay, and so that's why we often recommend that you do the assignments in that order, that you do the reading first, then do the guided reading assignment, and then do the discussion board, and finally conclude with the essay after you've done all the other assignments. That's the best way to go through um, what we're doing each week. Obviously, you can choose what order you do them in, but it, it's just going to help you do better if you follow that order. All right, so that's the discussion guide. Um, discussion guide, that's the uh, discussion board. The third assignment, just to kind of um, clarify, let me go back to the you know, one instruction page here. Uh, the third, assignments, uh, third assignment from week one was the uh, reflection essay. And here the idea is really more, um, you need to take a stance. You need to, um, usually what's gonna happen in the reflection essay is you're gonna be given a topic or a prompt. And you're gonna be asked a question. So what happened here, you, you had a bunch of instructions and then um, you get all of these questions. Okay, so your answer to these questions is going to, um, as you answer all of these questions, this, uh, the task portion here, this is really walking you through how to prepare for an essay. And so it's giving you the scope of what the essay would cover, which is you wanna read through Isaiah, so this is gonna be about Isaiah. And then you're gonna focus in on these chapters, and then you're gonna think about these questions after you've read this. You're gonna answer each of these questions, not necessarily like, 
your essay isn't, you're going to answer these before you write your essay. You're going to think about each of these questions and, and say, how would I answer this? Okay, and then with the material that you get from going through these questions, you're going to organize your understanding of the relationship between Isaiah 36 to 39, the relationship between that section and the first section, and the relationship between this section and the final section, and then how it relates to Isaiah as a whole. You're going to organize that into an essay. So you're going to organize your essay around a thesis. At the very least, you're going to organize it around a primary topic or purpose. Uh, it, I highly recommend that you have an introduction to your essay that clearly lays out here is the purpose or here is the thesis that I'm going to try to prove in this essay. Here's what I'm trying to say. Here's what I think you should agree with me about. Here's the major point that I'm trying to make. You want to make that clear in your introduction. And then also in your introduction, it's helpful to give a little bit of a roadmap for where the essay is going to go. So outline kind of first when we're going to do this, or, or first I'm going to prove this, or first I'm going to argue this, then I'm going to argue this, then I'm going to argue this. And by arguing all three of these things, I will demonstrate that my thesis or my, my purpose is uh, correct or accomplished. All right, so an introduction is really going to help the reader prepare for the rest of your essay so that they can, under, they can follow your argument better. All right, so please include in your essay an introduction that clearly states your thesis or your primary purpose, and then also kind of gives a bit of a roadmap for where the essay is going to go. Within the body of your essay, you should make your arguments, your arguments that support your thesis. And I would recommend that you only, you only have one argument per paragraph. Uh, it's going to be easier to follow that way. So each paragraph should have a kind of a topic sentence that tells us, okay, here's what we're talking about in this paragraph, and then evidence that supports that topic. So whether that's evidence from scripture or evidence from your secondary reading, um, that, will, that will be a good way to structure your essay. So on the essays, we talked about how I'm going to grade them. You need to have a clear purpose or thesis in your introduction. You need to give a, a clear kind of uh, summary of where the argument's going to go, where the paper's going to go. Only include one argument per paragraph. When you include more than one argument per paragraph, it gets a little hard to follow. And then make sure that you're supporting each argument with evidence from the biblical text and evidence from the secondary reading where appropriate. As you bring information in from outside sources, other than scripture, like your textbook, you want to explain why you're bringing that evidence in how that evidence supports your argument, and you also want to explain why that evidence is reliable or why you agree with it or why you disagree with it. A quick word about citations, especially of the secondary literature. Uh, that's your textbook or other sources that you use besides the Bible. You need to cite your source not only when you quote them, but anytime you're incorporating ideas from another source, you need to put a citation there. So obviously when you're quoting someone, you need to include that material within quotation marks, and you need to insert um, either parenthetically or by a footnote, you need to insert a citation of where that material comes from. Not just the name of the author, uh, but the page number of the book. So if it's your textbook, you know, um, it's best to cite by footnote, but if you cite parenthetically, just put the author's name, comma, the numeral for the page number. You don't have to put P period or uh, page or anything like that. Just put a comma and then the page number. But make sure that you're actually directing the reader to the specific location of that quote and make sure that that quotation is within quotation marks and make sure that uh, you have correctly transcribed the quote. There are places where I've seen quotations and the wording isn't correct or there's a misspelling or something like that. So make sure if you're quoting something that you've got it exact. Um, but even if you're not quoting, if you're just paraphrasing, uh, and there's a difference between paraphrasing and rewording. Rewording can happen when you take a quote and you change a few words. Okay, if you do that, you might as well just quote the person because that is probably the most dangerous place when it comes to plagiarism. Uh, if all you're doing is taking a quotation and changing a few words so that you don't have to quote, that, that's really worse than superfluous quotations. If you're going to paraphrase someone, that is to say you're, you're not going to quote them, you're going to paraphrase them, you really need to say the idea in your own words, not just change a few words. Summarization is the primary way you should include secondary information. You really need to pick out the most important details. Um, if it's not important, it shouldn't be brought in. All right, so you want to summarize the large portions. You want to summarize uh, the arguments so that you're only bringing in the most important parts. When you have evidence to bring in for consideration, it's best to paraphrase that evidence rather than quote it, okay? Quotations should be reserved for those situations where the precise wording of the author is important to your own argument. Um, what you really need to do is um, evaluate. When you're quoting a secondary source, you need to give some sort of evaluation of the quotation. You need to, you need to say why this quote is correct, why what the author says is correct, why, why the reader should agree with the author, or why the reader should disagree with the author. You need to include some sort of evaluation of that quotation. Otherwise, you're not quoting evidence, you're just sort of using the quotation as a rhetorical illustration. You're saying, uh, so-and-so worded it this way, which is really, I think, a good way of putting it. Well, that's not evidence, that's just illustrating the point that you're already making, all right? So quotations don't count as evidence for your argument unless you're actually quoting facts, and facts probably shouldn't be quoted, they should be paraphrased, uh, because facts are not 
ideas that you can attribute to someone. Uh, you can you can paraphrase the facts, and you still need to cite the source where you got those facts, so that your reader can then investigate the source and find out whether the source is reliable in its stating of the facts. But I, I, I want you to. I don't want you to just be including a bunch of quotations in order to get credit for um, reference to your sources. Just including quotations does not mean that you're integrating the thoughts of your reader. Uh, just including quotations doesn't mean that you've integrated the arguments of the secondary literature. It just means you found a sentence that you like, you've quoted it, and you've put it in your essay. But unless you evaluate that, unless you tell us why that's a good statement or why we should disagree with it, you haven't integrated it. You've just pasted it in there. Uh, it's especially egregious when you paste it in there with no introduction to the quotation, no explanation for why you're including it. You make a point, and then you quote something, and then you make another point. There's no context for that quotation. Um, it, it's not clear why it's there. You need to evaluate uh, or at least contextualize the quotations. All right. Enough about quotations, uh, citing secondary sources. Uh, I want to encourage you as well to include a, a conclusion. This does not have to be long. This can be a couple sentences. But a conclusion, the purpose of a conclusion is to remind the reader of what your thesis was. This is what I was trying to convince you of in this essay. Here's what I wanted to convince you of. And here is the argument that I made for it. So because of point one, because of point two, because of point three, it's obvious that whatever your thesis is, is true. Okay. When you include an introduction with a thesis and a roadmap and you include a conclusion that is reviewing your major arguments, that's going to help your reader know what's an argument, what's evidence, what, what, how they're supposed to follow through your essay. Um, looking forward now, previewing uh, this week's um, focus. We're in unit two now. And so, again, only three uh, submissions this week and you've got a lighter reading load than you did. Uh, similar amount of Bible reading, but your... Um, your textbook reading is uh, almost half of what it was uh, last week. So that, that's hopefully good news for you. I'll give you a chance to catch up on last week's reading if you're behind. Again, the guided reading assignment, finish your reading first if you can before doing the guided reading assignment because um, this is just going to focus in on a few points. Most of these guided readings are only you know four to 10 questions. So it's not gonna cover everything, but it should get you thinking in detail about stuff that will be covered in the discussion and the essay. Uh, the post only has to be 150 to 200 words. If you're doing a full chapter, this is not going to be a deep dive. This is not going to be super in depth, okay? I don't expect that. What I'm looking for here is your approach. How do you approach the meaning of a passage? You know, what sorts of questions are you asking about the passage? How do you determine? How do you, how do you decide what it means? You know, are you simply looking at the words? Are you looking at the historical context? Um, are are you thinking about how it applies to us today? Things like that. What is your approach? All right. So hopefully. Um, this is pretty straightforward. You've been through this once with the Isaiah passage. Shouldn't be any surprises here. Uh, and then finally, the essay for this week. Let's go back to the essay. All right, so here what you're going to do is read through Jeremiah. Again, this is an overview. Read through it quickly. Um, and then read through chapter 7. This is the Temple of the Lord passage here. And you're going to think about So just jot down, as you read through chapter 7, jot down your answer to all of these questions. Okay? Think about all of this. Make sure you're guiding the reader uh, with clear transition sentences, maybe even headings. But the most important thing, more important than structure, is clarity. Okay? Um, the point of good structure is to be clear. So again, I'm open to you structuring this in different ways, but I need to come away from reading your essay with a clear idea of here is this person's, this is what this, is what this student wants me to, to believe. Um, it's clear to me that this student wants me to think blank about the temple of the Lord in Jeremiah's message, okay? I need clarity when I walk away from the essay. So however you want to structure it to, to make that um, make that happen is, is up to you, um, but, but please consider how clear your argument is to someone else.